Good morning. Let's all stand and invoke the Holy Spirit to guide us in our reflection this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, equal in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit that shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant us the same spirit to be truly wise, ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As we know, the very first book of the sacred books, scriptures, Old Testament, is the book of Genesis. There, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. This reference to God as a creator of all things means that God worked. Not in the sense of our work on earth, but God, he worked, which means he is the creator of all things. Then he proceeds with his creative work as portrayed by the six days of creation. Each day, starting with the elements of the earth, plants, animals, and so on and so forth. And each time, at the end of the first, creation, first day of creation, second day of creation, so on and so forth, each time we hear, hear the scripture telling us, God saw and it was good. It was very good, very good. Animals, minerals, stars, heaven, everything was good. When it came to the sixth day, the last day of creation, it's a special day. Because that's the day when God created mankind. How did he create mankind? Now, different from all the other creation, he says, let us make man in our own image and likeness. Unlike the, day, unlike the five days of creation, sixth day, creation of man was very special because also it's very good, but different from other days of creation. When God said, I saw, I was very pleased with everything that I created. So why so special about the sixth day? Precisely as we read, let us make man in our own image and likeness. So what is this image? A simple example would be you stand in front of a mirror and we men, let's say, get ready to go out, put a coat on or ties or whatever have you, right? I kind of brush a little bit there, comb my hair, make sure it's straight. We may not perhaps spend more time in front of the image of the mirror because you have to do a little more makeup and make sure there's pretty and appealing, things like this. So good. Mirror is the image. In front, stand in front of the mirror, you see yourself, yourself reflect on the image with your own image in the mirror. Okay, everything is fine, then you leave. Well, what about the mirror? It's not your image, but the mirror is God himself. In other words, you're standing in front of God and you see your image reflected on the mirror who is God. That's the kind of idea we get here in the sense of let us make man in our own image, our own likeness. So what is this image of God that we should see? Let's say pretending you're standing in front of the mirror but the mirror is God himself. You stand yourself in front of God and see yourself. What's the image there? Well, among many things, the book of Leviticus tells us, you shall be holy, for I am the Lord your God, who am holy. In other words, we see ourselves creating image and likeness of God. That image is God himself who is holy. We should see ourselves reflected in our own personal holiness. Jesus himself says in the New Testament, be perfect as your heavenly Father 
is perfect. The Lord uses the, the word perfect. It's not house is perfect, everything is orderly, everything is whatever, perfection. Perfect bridge, perfect product we make. But perfection here means holiness. So the Lord is also telling us, try to remember your image. You're created by God who's holy. You should reflect that image of holiness. Be perfect because your heavenly Father is perfect. In fact, St. Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 to 16, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. When St. Paul says about Jesus Christ, his son of God, but as man, he's also image of God on earth. We're celebrating, preparing for the birth of Jesus Christ, time of Advent. Key thing about Advent is no, is the third verse of our daily prayer at noon, the Angelus prayer. You stand and say, Verum caro factum est, et habitabit in nobis. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Well, Advent is the time to prepare to receive the coming of God who is invisible, who becomes visible, is Jesus Christ, who is a perfect image of God himself, who is holy. In that context, St. Paul reminds us, we are image of perfection in us, holiness in us. We have to think about always reference to Jesus, who is the perfect image of God himself. In this regard, we think about Jesus as the working man. Since the topic and theme of this Advent reflection to, to this, this morning rolls around the topic of work, therefore, it's important to think of your work, my work, any kind of work we do, it's not merely a human work we do. Someone who is working in a nursing home, nurse, someone who's bus driver, someone who's a astrophysicist, someone who's astronaut, whatever the work we do, the work is not merely, cannot be merely human work. It is human work because human beings. But we are looking at the whole thing from Christian perspective. This different. How a Christian, because we're Christian, because we are united to Christ. Perfect man, perfect God, the Son of God who became man. We become one with him because he is our model. We are his images as Christians in the middle of the work, in the middle of the world, rather. So in this regard, when we talk about work now, it's not merely human work. Everybody works. But from Christian perspective, we have to approach the work we do from Christian perspective. What does it mean? It means always thinking about Jesus Christ, the working man, the worker. He worked with his own hands. But did he come from heaven just to work? No. When Jesus worked in his father's house, if you want, along with St. Joseph, we hear in the scriptures that Jesus Christ was a carpenter like his father, St. Joseph Carpenter. Now, carpentry is a very modern specialty. The time of Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, there was no carpentry per se. The proper way of dressing Jesus Christ is that he is a manual worker, a laborer. Sometimes I can imagine Jesus Christ being called from Nazareth by his friends, neighbors, Yeshua, yes, you need, we need your help. What is it you need help for? Our sewage system is blocked. Nobody else around could come and help us. But Jesus would go, roll up his sleeves, put his hands in the dirty sewage system, unblock with the skills that he acquired, and make things flow again. That's God, the Son of God, in his humanity, doing that kind of job, that kind of work. 
So to always think about, from Christian perspective, the work you and I, we do, it's not merely human work, just to solve a problem, to put bread on the table. No, this is why the first topic of the, this morning's reflection is that work, any kind of work we do, from Christian perspective, should always lead us to greater degree of personal holiness. Work is for holiness. Without, without Christian perspective, work is work, period. We solve problems. We clean the house. We serve the clients. We operate on people's whatever. In the hospital, nurses go around, and the kind that we work with is there. It's, it's precisely there, human work. Once more, let us then think about the idea, the reality is that you Christians, because you are Christians, always make reference to and unite with Christ, the Son of God, perfect image of the Father, who came down from heaven and assumed in your seeming human nature, he carried out just ordinary labor. A perfect God, perfect man once more. In his wonderful a post exhortation many, many years ago called Laborem Exercens. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but I, th I, I, I recommend at the end of this, this morning session some of the documents I'm going to mention to you. It might be worthwhile for you to at least give some time to read, not to perhaps the whole document, at least have a summary of some of the documents I've been mentioning to you. One of the key documents is this. St. John Paul II gave us this wonderful document about Christian meaning of work called Laborem Excellences. In that he says, number 26, Christ, the man of work. This is what he says. The truth that by means of work, man participates in the activity of God himself, his creator, was given particular prominence by Jesus Christ. The Jesus, at whom many of his first listeners in Nazareth were astonished, saying, where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom given to him? Is not this the carpenter? For Jesus not only proclaimed, but first and foremost fulfilled by his deeds, the gospel, the world eternal wisdom that had been entrusted to him. Therefore, this was so also the gospel of work, because he who proclaimed it was his, uh, himself a man of work, a craftsman like Joseph of Nazareth. Very interesting it, insight that John Paul II wants to share with us and transmit it to us encourage all of us. When he said the phrase, the gospel of work, I don't know what thoughts come to your mind right now when you hear the word, how can you equate human work with the gospel? What is gospel? Gospel is evangelium. There are four gospels. What is gospel though? It's a good news, beautiful news, wonderful news. So in this regard, Jesus Christ having assumed human nature, being a laborer, as St. Paul II points out, he's the one once more to whom we have to refer because for us Christians, work is gospel. In other words, work is where through which we enjoy the blessing of the Lord. Gospel means many things, but above all, it means holiness. It means being, becoming more perfect, in the eyes of God, in becoming, never losing, or understanding the approach we have work is not merely a pragmatic approach, but from the light from heaven as the real meaning of work we do is for our own holiness. It's through our work on this earth we'll attain the true gospel, which means heaven. So therefore, the Lord himself says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. St. John Paul said, 
Saint Jose Maria Escrivéda Balaguer, founder of Opus Dei. He was a great champion of transmitting this message for all the ordinary Christians in the middle of work to once more wake up, awaken rather, the supernatural vision that so many Christians in the middle of the world have more or less lost. Like anybody else, you, all of you, you go to work, domestic work for women or whatever work you, you carry out. Okay, just think, pause at this moment and think. This gospel of work that so John Paul II just mentioned that I recall to you, in your daily work now as a Christian, how much of that are you aware? That the work you, the work you do has supernatural, transcendental meaning that goes way beyond the earthly realities. It's something that's beautiful, something that touches heaven. If that's the case, and that should be the case, you should carry out work with joy in your heart. You're doing something that is passing, nothing that is something is ephemeral, transitory. The work you do, it is, you're touching heaven with it. In that context, therefore, St. Jose Maria Escriva La Guerre, always encouraging ordinary Christians Precisely your mission as a Christian in the middle of the world is through the work you carry out, ordinary work you carry out. You're called by Jesus Christ with his own example and teaching. Be perfect, be holy, spiritual holiness. Not only is it possible, it's a mandate, demand, commandment of God. Be perfect. God did not say, well, try your best. No. It's a commandment of love, commandment God, God himself gives us. So strive for holiness in and through all the challenges you have, but I'll make it possible for you. Because Jesus himself assumed, once more, human labor in his own humanity. This is why St. Jose Maria Escrivá, the founder of Puj Dei, said one of his homilies called The Friends of God, professional work, whatever it is, becomes a lamp to enlighten your colleagues and friends. That is why I usually tell those who become members of Opus Dei, the same applies to all of you now listening to me, what use is it telling me that so-and-so is a good son of mine, a good Christian, but a bad shoemaker? If he doesn't try to learn his trade well or doesn't give his full attention to it, he won't be able to sanctify it or offer it to our Lord. The sanctification of ordinary work is, as it were, the hinge of true spirituality for people who, like us, have decided to come close to God while being at the same time fully involved in temporal affairs. Very telling phrase when he says, someone is a member of Opus Dei. that applies to all Christians. I want to really commit myself to live my Christianity. So spiritually, all of us are trying to do that. So more or less what he's saying is that you want to be authentic Christian, Persian holiness, good, wonderful, but you're a bad shoemaker, then you cannot become holy. In other words, the work we do, the demand, the work, makes demands on us. Now we're going to explore for the rest of this conference this morning, this particular talk about virtues. If I pray a lot, which we should do, I go to church, participate in all the activities of the church, fine, man who is pious. But genuine piety means at the same time translate transfer the union with God, which is what life of piety is all about, into ordinary things we do. Prayer and work, work and prayer, they cannot be a distinction in the sense of everything we do should lead us to giving all the glory to God. In that context, what can I say once more, oh, I want to be holy by praying a lot, but when it comes to my work, I'm lazy. I delay many things. I do things haphazardly. I just do whatever I can, but then if things are not well done, I just brush it on the carpet. 
Nobody can see my defects. Professional work, professional work demands a lot. What is the work we do? So that demand is a wonderful thing because I want to do this not only for human virtues per se, but human virtues are indications of manifestation of my own personal holiness. So this is why I'm going to develop now the rest of this morning's conference on virtues. As you know, when someone is proposed as a candidate for sainthood, then we go to Vatican, all the processes are made. What do the people investigate or gather material on? Church asks, witnesses come forth. Witnesses to have known this candidate for the process of canonization, please come forward and give us your testimonies. So the church gathers testimonies of the candidate for the priest for the sainthood based on seven virtues. The first is theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. How did this person, ordinary Christian like you and me, in his or her own life, mostly as a lay person like you, some of them priests, some of them religious, does not matter, but as a Christian, how did this person practice three theological virtues? Did this person practice those virtues to the heroic degree, which means constancy? And then he asks for four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. If there are sufficient testimony and lots of group of people come forward and say, yes, I testify, I testify, I testify. Based on all that, the church then says, okay, this person's process of canonization can proceed as a servant of God. That's the first stage of canonization. People pray fervently, and God allows, accepts the prayer, and then through the intercession of so-and-so, servant of God, miracle takes place. The Vatican analyzes, investigates the miracle per se, based on medical science, and then medical science says something took place here, a healing took place, which is beyond medical science. The church says, therefore, we attribute this to God's intervention. Therefore, a miracle took place because this person who died, died in, let's say, order of holiness. We say that he's in heaven, she's in heaven. God has allowed this person to his virtues to be recognized by the rest of the Christian community. Therefore, the church declares this person blessed. And afterwards, if there are more prayers, more process going on, another miracle takes place, and then the person is canonized. So this brief background of the process of canonization, recognizing on the authority of the church, Christian like you and me, to be a blessed or a saint, everything is based on proof of virtues. So what is a virtue? The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, a virtue is an habitual and firm disposition to the good. It allows the person not only to perform good acts, but to give the best of himself. The virtuous person tends toward the good with all his sensory and spiritual powers. He pursues the good and chooses it in concrete actions. So, Virtue, fundamentally, is habit. I'm not a virtuous person if I'm patient two times out of 10. Good, two times out of 10, you're patient, good, but you're not a virtuous person yet because you do not have the virtue yet. If I'm patient seven times out of 10, yeah, I'm getting there. Eight times, good. Nine times, good, but try for 10 times. 10 out of 10, you're always patient. Well. That's really a habit that is really, we possess the habit. It's a virtuous person, is that, that idea. That's why St. Gregory of Nyssa, one of the great fathers of the church, says, the goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. God is perfect. All the virtues 
we talk about reflection of God's own holiness. Therefore, let us examine then briefly the four cardinal virtues, how the God, Lord, is asking all of us to practice those virtues the, as we carry out our daily activities, professional work, household chores, things we do every day. It cannot be merely once more human action per se. It cannot be. It's a Christian point of view. If always think about what virtue in this particular circumstance of my life is the Lord asking me to practice, to show him our love for him and our desire to use that opportunity to become more virtuous person, more like God himself. As St. Gregory says, the goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. So we start with the first of the cardinal virtues, the virtue of prudence. Again, Charism says, prudence is the virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. The prudent man looks where he is going. Prudence is the right reason in action according to St. Thomas Aquinas. So prudence is about the goal, goal. And the goal has to be good goal. I direct all things that I do to that goal. And prudent person means that in all things that I do, I seek Deo omnis gloria. I seek glory of God. First thing to about, think about is this, therefore, in our work, whatever I do, in, habitually, do I seek to give glory to God? Does it enter into mind, the heart, when you're sweeping the floor, when you're preparing the meal for your family, or you're going to drive to work in a factory, or go to some other professional work you do? Every day, the work we do, what is the interior intention, deep, profound intention. Do you continue to seek to give all the glory to God? We have to make that intention known, expressed. Although, yes, inherently, because we're Christians, we think of God all the time, the presence of God. Can I, can I take it for granted? Yeah, I'm, everything that I do is for the glory of God. Fine. But when it comes to concrete work we do, it's good to remember, no, this work, this folding up the laundry, ironing the shirt, to any other kind of work we do, what we should seek for is, once more, glory of God. That is how we practice prudence, because the goal that we have in mind is not human success. It's not doing our work, I get more money, fine. We should be properly remunerated for the work we do, the salary and things like that. But that's not the ultimate goal of our work as a Christian. Once more, glory of God. We all know about St. Elizabeth and Satan. She was a daughter of a distinguished colonial family in New York City. Her father was a physician and a professor at what has later become the Columbus University. Her grandfather was a rector at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church on Staten Island. So she was raised and born and raised as Ep Episcopalian, which is modified form of Anglicanism in the United States. She was not a Catholic. So she was born in 1774, and she married William McGee Seaton. At the age of 20, he, William was a very wealthy young businessman. So they married, happily married, and they started having children, five children in succession. But something happened in their life. Her husband had the business reversal and lost his fortune. So a lot of challenges in their life together. The source of income was reduced. Many challenges you can imagine there. And so William was undergoing a lot of emotional psychological problems because of business failure. Medical doctor advised them to take a break, go to go for a trip. And the place they went to, to, to go to a trip, make a trip to, was Italy. So they went on a voyage, 
to Italy, and there were hospi uh, hospitalities offered to them by a Catholic family called Felici family in Legon. So they went and then came back, and shortly afterwards, Elizabeth's husband, William, died, leaving one more five young children, no financial resources, in fact, a lot of debt. So Elizabeth had to do something, certainly. She prayed a lot, and from the beginning, she had certain inklings about Catholicism. So despite all the oppositions she going to face, she exercised prudence. I feel in my conscience, God is calling to me to become, uh, become Catholic. And one key reason for that was she had a great desire to receive the Holy Communion, which she could not do as an Episc Episcopalian. And then she had to set her sight how to survive, young five young children. So she prayed a lot, asking for guidance. And then what happened? Well, in August 1807, she was invited by a superior of the Baltimore Sulpicians, Catholic religious order, to found a school for girls near the Sulpician Seminary in Baltimore. With the help of Archbishop Carroll, she, Mary Elizabeth Ann, organized a group of young women to assist her in her work, receive the religious rule and habit from him, the Archbishop, and took the vows of religion. In 1809, she moved her headquarters to Emmitsburg, adopted the modified version of the rule of St. Vincent de Paul for the French Sisters of Charity, and laid the foundation for the Catholic parochial school system in the United States. She trained her sisters for teaching, wrote textbooks for classrooms, worked among the poor, the sick, the black people of the region, and directed the work of her congregation. 1814, she sent her nuns to open an orphanage in Philadelphia, another one in New York City, 1817. She died in Emmitsburg on January the 4th, 1821, was canonized by Saint Pope Paul VI on September 14th, 1975. As you know, she's the first American-born saint. And this woman accomplished more in 12 years of her labor than most, than most people can do a whole lifetime. So one of the key virtues she exercised, she has shown us, that of prudence, seeking the glory of God, seeking the good under difficult circumstances through her prayer and guidance God gave her, she then began to work. And a lot of us, a lot of people in the whole, not only North America, but other parts of the world too, are benefiting from what is known as, you know, the homeschooling. Wonderful. Not only the homeschooling, but she was, again, responsible, founder, if you want, of the, all the parochial school system in the United States. Fantastic work. But she did all for the glory of God. Let's go to the second virtue, which is virtue of justice. So what is justice? Just is the moral virtue that consists in constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. In this regard, since justice is one-to-one, -one, I, you, you and I, we perform each other's duties and obligations. That's justice fundamentally what it is all about. In this regard, Virtue of justice means that for all of us, we have responsibilities, we have duties. And we have to think of our duties and responsibilities, sense of justice, which means I want to perform, execute all these responsibilities from the point of view of holy sense of responsibility. I'm not being responsible only to my neighbor, to my community, to the church, which we should, but we have to see the thing from a supernatural point of view. No, I'm responsible in a holy way, render all these things to, once more, to God himself, rendering my responsibilities that are pleasing to God the Father. There is a member of Opus Dei, he's a supernumerary member, married person from Guatemala. He is the very first pediatrician in his country 
many, many years ago. He was declared venerable last year by Pope Francis. His name is Dr. Ernesto Cofinho. In an interview, the postulator for his cause of canonization, Father Santiago Gallejo, highlights Dr. Cofinho's generous life. Quote, Ernesto knew how to be loving husband and dedicated father. He aimed to be a good doctor, a great professional, knowing that work was his way of serving others and changing the peace of the world God has entrusted to him. In this, he is similar to most of us, work and family are, where we need to act as Jesus would. Ernesto devoted himself to serving others with all his heart. He also cared about fostering his own life as a Christian and encouraged those around him to grow in their spiritual lives. There are many things about this man, wonderful man, heroic man, but his work as pediatrician, very prestigious position occupied in the light of the in the light of the of his own country. He received a lot of rewards, or words rather also. But this man, in terms of justice, he executed his responsibility to a heroic degree. Sometimes just an idea here is that people who served are very poor people in Guatemala, indigenous people, they cannot afford. Dr. Neston knew that. If you justice, execute justice, well, I treat you for this, your child for this, the fee is so much. I mean, you could do that, right? Justice for this service is $100. Well, they cannot pay $100 many times. So what he, did he do? He rendered or gave the service gratis. No, you don't have to pay anything. But, of course, all these people were so grateful, they bring a chicken or a couple of eggs or something they can, at least something to show gratitude for this. And Ernesto will accept them and not even keep them. He'll distribute all these things to many other people who are poorer. So this regard means that he executes his responsibilities regardless of whether he gets, gets a uh, recognition for that or not. No, he executes his responsibilities, helping, serving the poor and the patient, the utter sense of responsibility towards God. Lord, you gave me this wonderful talent to be a established professional, my expertise, I'm a pediatrician. No matter what, I'll continue to render service for those who are in need. He was not bound by some external realities, but rather moved by sense of justice to honor God and honor our neighbor. So let's also then cultivate the way we approach our work. It's not about remunerations. It's not about recognition. It's not about applause. No, we should continue to work, no matter what, because we're giving, once more, seeking the, all the things to or the glory of God. At the same time, we're giving all the things to make, if you want, God happy. Third virtue is that of fortitude. Fortitude is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and consistency in the pursuit of the good. It strengthens the resolve to resist temptations to overcome obstacles in the moral life. So fundamentally, as you know, fortitude means there's an obstacle, difficulty. We face difficulties in all our work. I worked as a dentist in Montreal for six years. And well, I can imagine any profession you do. But as a dentist, like any professional work, there's some of the very challenges, challenges technical challenges, or the patient had to present this and that. Any challenge you have? Well, fortitude means I know the challenge, so what do I do? Do I just fold up and, okay, I, can, I give up? Or do I persist? Do I continue doing the work that I want to do? So in this context, fortitude is precisely facing challenges with firm in our purpose to continue to work with the perseverance. Another person I want to profile here is a woman. Her name is Dora del Hoyo. She's Spaniard, and from the perspective of Opus Dei that I belong to, she's the first assistant numerary. The title for those women who are celibate members who give their lives in the domestic 
source of the centers of Opus Dei and basically they live a hidden life. And they live kind of things they do, which is the world cannot appreciate much, but they, they, they dedicate themselves to that kind of profession work, which is called administration or household chores, domestic work if you want. So she is a servant of God, the first stage. Ernesto Cofino, he is a venerable, and soon we hope Dora will also progress to become a venerable so that her work, the Canada's impression, can proceed. One thing about her, there's biography written about her called The Lighted Lamp, a burning lamp. Before she joined Opus Dei, she, up in northern part of Spain, her professional work was a domestic servant in the 1930s, 40s. Spain, like many European countries, there were class distinctions. So she was hired to work in a family that was aristocracy. So when she was working in that household of a duchess, nobility in Spain, is her friend who gave us the following testimony about what happened to Dora del Rollo. The person who gave testimony is Rosalia Ropez. She said, Dora was working in the house of a person of nobility, duke or duchess. She was one day carrying a tray with a cup of tea and perhaps the wet floor or something similar, she slipped and fell hitting herself strongly on the floor. Can you imagine the scene there? The lady of the house, Duchess, looked at the whole thing and says, are the teacups broken? That was the idea. Are the teacups broken? Did you break the teacups? I mean, this woman was serving the Duchess, the tea, she fell down. She hurt herself. The only thing that she, the Duchess, was thinking about Never mind you, what about my teacups? Are they broken? The kind of class distinction society in which she was living. In other words, servants, many times in that kind of society was nobody type of idea. Not a slave, but. So what did she do? Dora de Oyo is quite an insult to call indifferent treatment. Teacup, me? No, is there anything about me? No. She smiled and apologized, got up, picked up the things, and I said, I'll come back and clean my lady. An example of fortitude. Being able to control herself, she could be very angry, mad, at the inhuman treatment. No, she smiled and apologized, saying that I cleaned up. Well, difficulties she faced, Dora de Oyo, she approached that with inner strength. So this is the kind of portrait of a saint, future saint, we pray, all of us in this regard too. The difficulties in you and my work, do they impede you from pursuing the good you have in mind? Or do you give up easily? Do you complain easily? Oh, too much work to do, too hard work to do, there's nobody's helping me, and we can go on and on. And but Those are the moments you have to say, no, I have to exercise fortitude. Help me, Lord, to persevere. So there's a biographer of her life by Spanish priest, Father Javier Medina. He wrote a book about her, and he was interviewed about the nature of this book. This book refers to domestic work as a real profession. How does it apply to Dora del Hoyo? So this author, Father Javier, said, in regard to work, the term profession designates occupations that require a high level of specific capabilities. And a professional is a person whose actions reflect high degree of competence. All the testimonies about her life concur in affirming that Dora carried her work, her domestic work, with competence and first-class professional. She mastered every aspect of that work and exercise it to the highest level. In order to achieve that kind of professional competence and professionality, you have to push yourself, push yourself, push yourself. 
make it better, learn the secret, all the things you have to know about that particular trade. But that's what she did all her life. Then we conclude with last of the four cardinal virtues as a way to grow in holiness, which is virtue of temperance. Temperance is the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. It ensures the will's mastery over instincts and keeps desires within the limits what is honorable. Temperance, therefore, refers to self-control, self-control. In related, work-related things, sometimes, you know, I pursue certain things because I like it. Not that we should not pursue things we like, but if we give in to whims and caprice, I like this work more, this work I don't like it, so I choose to do things that I like, the things I don't like doing, I delay, delay, and kind of avoid the whole thing. That person is not in self-mastery, is succumb to slavery, to whims and caprice. This is the idea about temperance, exercise in our work. Certain work we, we should do, we're hesitant to do that because perhaps it's more difficult, perhaps I don't like it that much, but someone it should be done. So temperance means no exercise, self-mastery put my will to the grind and say, no, I will do it. So this is where we avoid the natural tendency to succumb to comfort, pleasure, enjoyment too much. In this regard, to finish off this talk, I want to refer to another person, another member of Opus Dei. He is also a venerable, like Dr. Ernesto Cofino. He passed the stage of being servant of God, now he's honorable. Uh, venerable. Pope Francis has approved the publication of the decree about the virtues Isdoro lived a heroic degree. His name is Isdoro Thorothano, Argentinian who went to Spain, lived his life in, Argent in, in Spain for the rest of his life until he died young. He's an engineer, civil engineer in Spain. So can you speak about some of them uh, practices of his doro, his virtues. So the postulator of his cause also said about him, his doro loved his profession and knew that God called him to seek holiness in his work. His love for God, for example, spurred him to be the first to get to work in his office in the morning. He accepted with good humor and supernatural outlook the occasional annoyances and injustice of his boss. He sought to do everything with professional competence and tried to be pleasant in his dealings with others. He was well known for his sense of justice and closeness to the people he worked for him, who worked for him. They knew that with Don Isdoro, shabby work wouldn't do, because he always made sure personally that the job had been done conscientiously. Isdoro also gave classes in the Industrial School of Malaga. His pupils recall his great patience and that they could approach him to ask questions, even going to his home. Among the students, it was frequently said that he was a saint. Justice, temperance, fortitude, to this last virtue, what temperance, self-control. As we read, Isdoro suffered injustices. But how they deal with that? Temperance, self-mastery, keeping that patience, that losing that temper. I finish this presentation with a quote from St. John Paul II, once more who's calling all the lay people, all of you, Christians in the middle of the world, scared all of the world, to always think about your work in the middle of the world is not merely human work, you're building, building the kingdom of God, the gospel of work. So in his document, another document I, write, I recommend you read by John Paul II is Christi Fidelis Laici, the vocation and, and mission of the lay people in the middle of the world. I quote from number 17 when he says, the eyes of faith behold a wonderful scene that of a countless number of lay people, both women and men, busy at work in their daily life and activity, 
oftentimes far from view and quite unacclaimed by the world, unknown to the world's great personages, but nonetheless looked upon in love by the Father, untiring laborers who work in the Lord's vineyards. Confident and steadfast through the power of God's grace, these are the humble yet great builders of the kingdom of God in history. So in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God is holy. Our Christian image in the middle of the world should be that of reflecting God's own holiness. How do you do that? Through our ordinary work by practicing virtues, virtues are reflections of personal holiness, especially the four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Holy Mary, mirror of justice, pray for us. I'll be now going to the confessional while Father Jeff is going to make the exposition and for a silent reflection. <laughs> 